because I move, you know, a little bit. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. the just to the mercy of the strong. We worship the God who turns crosses into crowns. With hearts that long for life but fear the triumph of death, we worship the God who turns the vanquished into victors. Even in a dangerous world, Christ is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Even in discouraging days, Christ is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. 
Even in a world that denies the power of love, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Thanks be to God. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Welcome to worship on this Easter Sunday at Christ Presbyterian Church in Carlsbad, California. I want you to know that the NCAA has no corner on March Madness. <laughs> really, today is Easter Madness because today we learned this morning that Carol, our beloved nursery caregiver, uh, has a broken arm and her daughter, who is going to be her, her partner today in the nursery, is with her mom. So we have no nursery. So it's Easter madness here. <laughs> so what we have is activity tables in the back for, uh, for grade schoolers, kindergartners, and, and we also have, a, we do have a, a baby space, our nice name for the cry room back there, it's small for like infants and such. Uh, but we're also just gonna, just gonna have some kid noise, and you know what? Kid noise in a church is a wonderful gift. I invite you now to turn and greet one another in the name of our Lord, even as I greet all of you who are gathering with us, near or far, uh, whether it's live, whether it's on Easter Day or some other day, uh, every, every day is Easter Day. Every day is the day of resurrection as we celebrate uh, the good news that God's last and best word to us is life, always life. So welcome, and we hope this is a blessed Easter uh, wherever, wherever you are. Thanks be to God. Amen. 
So we have a few quick announcements for you today, and the first is from Eileen. Uh, I am delighted to draw your attention to um, two really important uh, classes that are coming up here um, at CPC. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, Sue Liesgang, who is a member of our congregation, a teacher extraordinaire, uh, she retired, and so she had all of this wonderful free time that she has been <laughs> devoting to our youth, truly. Um, and we started partnering uh, to mentor our teens after vacation Bible school. We would feed them lunch and give them some tips on um, hanging out with the littles. And I found that during that time, I was actually probably learning more about how to um, interact with kids in this really profound way. And I found myself when there were tricky moments with some of the littles going to Sue and being like, what do I do? And she would have these amazing interventions that were so easy and so positive. And my interactions changed with the kids. So in her wonderful retirement, she has volunteered to bring that wisdom um, to our parents here at CPC. So the next one is coming up on Friday, April 5th. It's from 5 to 7. And, it's, and there's going to be an extended hangout time. Um, for those who know Sue, they know the spread of food. When it says heavy hors d'oeuvres, you will not leave hungry. Um, there is going to be a time to connect with other parents. And then there's going to be a, a short presentation interactive on why does my child do that? So if you have ever asked that question, um, there might be a profound and simple response that, that Shu, Sue is going to be able to share with you. Um, I actually got to go to the first one of the parenting classes. And even from that, I called my brother, who has a two and a half year old, and I was like, listen to this wisdom. And it's worked. So um, we would invite you to that. And then there is a second one. Um, and this is for our parents with teens and tweens. Um, again, I announced this at middle school, and my middle school friends were like, ooh, our parents should go to that because Miss Sue knows what she's talking about, and they want their parents to hear this wisdom. Um, so we have actually planned it to begin. Um, it starts April 17th, and it will coincide with middle school youth group. So if you already have a student in our middle school program, there will also be childcare available um, if you have students that are younger than that. Um, and it's really actually fun. There will be food for them. There will be activities. Last time, we didn't even get to the movie because we were just having so much fun. Um, and so we, anybody who, even if you're like me and you just have children in your world and you want to learn how to better interact with them, this is a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. We are so grateful for Sue doing this and we would Check it out online. There's um, sign-up forms, and we hope to see you all there. That class was titled, Why Does My Husband Do That? My wife, Kathy, would sign up for it in a heartbeat. <laughs> Just real quickly, coming up Friday with friends once a month on the third Sunday, usually we have this lovely little No Agenda Fellowship gathering that is rolling start at 4.30. It's sort of, we don't call it this, but it's really Presbyterian happy hour. Uh, appetizers, and there, someone tells a great story at 6. Anyway, Deal says about all these things are the bulletin. Very special that we have a turning to our series of jazz concerts. And uh, Sunday, uh, April 21st, 4 o'clock, there's a jazz concert here, the Russell Bizet Trio. If you go online, you can hear them. They're fabulous. Uh, but they'll be here live in the sanctuary. And before that, there's a... Um, uh, a gathering over in the garden, our Centella Street garden, our church garden, which is a community garden open to all, is, is hosting this, and they're having a little, uh, a little Presbyterian happy hour before that, I guess, at three o'clock. <laughs> hmm, theme. Um, Friday, May 3rd, da, 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 da. Indiana Jones will be here personally. Well, his movie will be here, uh, The Dial of Destiny, and it's a fundraiser to send our youth to camp. Uh, so that will be fun. Uh, also coming up, our Women's Retreat, uh, the third weekend in May. And also, Bible School, which we call that uh, Vacation Bible Experience here. Uh, that's coming up in June. There are details about all this in the bulletin, but uh, we celebrate today on Easter all the life that's just uh, flowing out of this church in every direction. Now I'd like to invite the kids to come forward, our children's ensemble, to sing.
Yeah. This is actually good for blue. Come on, sinner, don't be late. Bless every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart. Are there any other kids who want to join us up on the steps for the children's time? Come on up, friends. Ben, <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> All right. Good morning, friends. All right. Well, happy Easter to you all. I'm so happy to see you all. So today, we are talking about a word that I think can be a little bit confusing. Have you heard the word said today, resurrection? in the service? Not yet? Okay. Well, well, it's coming. We're going to be talking about that. And resurrection was what happened to Jesus. Jesus died, and they put him in this tomb, and then his friends went to go and, and pay respects to him, and he wasn't there. And they were like, what happened? So I was trying to think about this in terms of how, how, do, we as, how do we talk about it, um, especially with kids, right? So I wanted to share something kind of special. So I had a neighbor, he was a very good friend of mine. His name was Griff. And Griff had something really special in his backyard. He had a lime tree that produces the best limes I've ever tasted. There's so one time one fell into our yard, and I tasted it, and I'm like, what is this magic lime? So then we became really good friends with Griff. And um, I was like, hey, if you ever have extra limes, and he was like, we always have extra limes. And so about every couple weeks, Griff would come over with a bag full of limes for me. And I was like, oh, I'm so happy. These are just the best. I would even like juice them and freeze them because I love them so much. And then I got really sad news. Griff came over one day and he said, my wife and I are moving. And I was like, oh no. And then Richard made it really sad because he goes, I wonder if this means your lime supply is over. <laughs> I was like, oh no. And and then kind of, <laughs> um, and, like we have new neighbors and I don't know what they're going to do with the lime tree. I don't know if they're going to keep it. And, um, and sometimes like I can see the lime from my window and I'm just like, 
So just before Griff moved and he brought over one last bag of limes, I, I was cutting them up and I found a seed. And for some reason, these lime trees, they don't have a lot of seeds. And I kind of was like, I, I was really protective of the seed. So I went on Google and I read exactly how you're supposed to plant a lime tree seed. And, and I took care of it and I got this cute little pot. I should have brought it because it was a little owl. And I put some dirt in it. And, and then I, I put um, saran wrap over the top because apparently that makes it like a little greenhouse and it's like the most ideal situation. And um, I put it in my window still and nothing happened. And I was so <laughs> sad. And there was this part of me that it was like, well, I should just put the dirt back out in the garden because nothing happened. And I was kind of like, I don't know, a little bit like hoping that something would happen. And then, like maybe three weeks went by, and one day I saw a tiny green sprout in the pot. And I got so excited. And now I still have it. And look, there's six little leaves on it. And I don't know what's going to happen. I've never grown a lime tree before, but I think that this is kind of my, what I think resurrection is like, because I put this little seed into a, a little pot of dirt and, and I was really sad because I didn't think anything was going to happen. And then the best kind of prize I think is a surprise. It grew. It grew leaves, I know. And I'm so hopeful that it's going to keep growing leaves. And I hope there's an expert in our congregation that knows about this and is going to tell me how to make this fruit. But that's what we're celebrating today. We're celebrating that something really sad happened, but Jesus turned it around. Jesus came and he was alive and his friends were so excited. And that joy, that's the joy that Jesus wants us to have all of the time. And I hope that for you today and every day. Will you pray with me? God, thank you that in moments when it seems like it's just not going to work out, that sometimes you surprise us and you say, it is going to work out. And we know because Jesus was alive. Jesus went and saw his friends and said, the bad things that happened don't define every part of life. And God, may we know that truth today and always. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys want to Jesus was the little children, all the children of the world. Every color, shape, and size, they are precious in his eyes. Jesus loves the little children of the I invite your attention to the prayer page in the bulletin. Number of joys and concerns there. Trish Collins uh, uh, has had a very likely benign tumor in the lining of the brain for some time, but it started to grow, so she's going to need either surgery or radiation. So this sort of came out of the blue, so prayers for Trish and for Pat, who's himself recovering from surgery. Uh, Judy Apple this Thursday will receive a stem cell transplant, uh, and a, a new treatment to, hope to deal with her Parkinson's. And I just learned this morning that Mark Walsh this Thursday will also receive a stem cell transplant uh, aimed at kidney issues that cause him to have dialysis. So prayers for you, Mark, and for you, Judy, uh, this Thursday and beyond. Uh, Marie Bradley uh, received a, a new aortic valve in the heart a week ago, which went well. Uh, George Whitfield and uh, a number of our folks are going through uh, chemotherapy. We pray, we pray for all of them uh, and all of those on our prayer list. This coming Saturday, uh, there will be a memorial service here in the sanctuary for Helga Olivka, who is our 30 years, was our church uh, nursery caregiver until the pandemic. So prayers, prayer, until after the pandemic. So prayers for her family, and you're invited to come at 11 in the morning to celebrate her life. Uh, and we ask prayers of sympathy for, uh, for Roy Martins and his wife, Bonnie Varner, in the loss of Bonnie's son, Mike. Uh, who uh, died as a result of injuries, suffered in a car bike accident he was riding. He was well known in the uh, San Diego music scene uh, and this, uh, just in his early 50s. So prayers for uh, Vani and for Roy and for all, all who love Mike. 
And we pray too for Joe Prack, who sings in our choir, who just lost her brother, and uh, not too long ago lost her niece as well. Uh, and for Neil Pressa, who recently lost his grandmother. Uh, we pray for those who need resurrection, the people and the places in our world, from Ukraine to, to Gaza to uh, Haiti, so many places. We pray for the leaders of nations. We pray for our Jewish friends next door, our Muslim friends uh, at Tri-City Islamic Center, and all those who are in difficult times for months now as the conflict in, uh, in Gaza and Israel has continued. And we pray for uh, Hands of Peace. Today is officially the very last day of Hands of Peace, an organization that uh, for 20 years brought Israeli and Palestinian young people, first to Chicago and then to Chicago and Carlsbad, uh, to plant seeds for a future peace along with American young people. And uh, Gretchen Grad, who's the founder of that, has been with us these last many Sundays. Um, uh, she's the founder of that program. And so uh, we honor you, Gretchen, and all those who worked so hard as part of Hands of Peace, including many people in our church, the Reese family, the Middleton family. Many of you served as uh, host families and uh, we're, we're part of the whole, the leadership team. Uh, so we're grateful for all them. And we know that the 800 and some alumni uh, who are in many places in the world, but are still in Israel, Palestine, a great, great, great many, uh, their, their work will go on. So we, we pray for them, uh, especially in these times and for the work of peace that they undertook. And we are today want to say a special thank you to all of our musicians uh, who have been working for weeks and weeks, two, two rehearsals a week to prepare for, for a Holy Week and to Lent, for our audiovisual team, for Lisa who does the screens, for all the, uh, our hospitality team, all the folks that work extra, extra hard during Lent and Easter to make it holy and joyful. Two words that belong together, holy and joyful. Now Eileen will lead us in the prayers of the people. Our prayers this morning were written by our friend Carol Book. Please join me in prayer. Father, we come before you joyfully, knowing that your precious Son, Jesus Christ, the greatest gift to all mankind, lives eternally with you in heaven. We are filled with thanksgiving because we are called your children and that our belief in Jesus as your Son will also give us the same eternal life. We confess to you our transgressions and know that you will forgive us. You give us the Holy Spirit to lead us into righteous living in order that our lives will be a credit to you and your love. We strive to be worthy of that great blessing. Good and gracious God, our most glorious creator, as we greet the signs in nature around us, we offer our deepest gratitude Signs of spring once again regale us in blooming flowers, in the songs of birds, and in the hope of fields seen soon to be planted. We give you praise for an even greater sign of new life, the resurrection of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, which we especially celebrate at this time. The sadness and despair of his death has given way to the bright promise of immortality. For the resurrection is our guarantee that justice will triumph over brutality, light will overcome darkness, and love will conquer death. As we celebrate, we also dare to ask for your grace that we may live in the promise given to us by imitating the life of Jesus and reaching out to the poor, the marginalized, the least among us. We strive to be neighbor to all those we meet, Please give your tender care to those in our congregation needing healing and to those grieving the loss of loved ones. We ask special blessing each and every day on our chosen leaders. Working with them, may we strive to make this great country of ours a beacon of hope and justice in a world hungry for peace and so in need of your love. We praise you in this Easter season. Change our lives, change our hearts to be messengers of Easter joy and hope. We make our prayer through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, forever, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. 
On Easter, I often think about the folks who are here for someone else's sake, people who come because their dad made them come or their wife did, people that maybe have doubts about this whole Jesus thing, if not doubts about God in general. I think about them because I'm sort of one of them. I always had doubts and wonders. I think Easter is an awful lot to believe in. It's an awful lot to believe in. I sometimes think, think it would be better to learn about the faith on an ordinary Sunday instead of a Sunday like Easter, to come to start to explore Christian faith on a day when we're listening to one of Jesus' parables that is as engaging today as it was when he first said it, or talking about the healing of a blind man and wondering, where am I blind? Where do I need to see to really see uh, this world around me? But it's Easter, so we'll begin, we'll begin with the end in mind. And we'll turn to the Easter story as it comes in the Gospel of John. Jesus has been crucified on Friday, Good Friday, at the intersection of the, the religious power and political power. They conspire to put him on the cross. At the, after the crucifixion, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, a secret disciple, and Nicodemus, who's one of the Jewish leaders who was curious about Jesus, they both come to Jesus now in, in broad daylight to take, to take the body of Jesus from the cross to get it ready for burial, to put it in the grave, just in time for darkness to fall, the Sabbath to begin, when no work could be done. 
Saturday is the Sabbath. Nothing happens on the set. And then John's Gospel tells the story of Easter morning this way, with Mary coming to the tomb alone in the dark. And she sees the stones rolled away. She runs to tell the disciples. Two of them run back with her to look in the tomb. They see the grave clothes lying there. But they don't really know what's happened. So they run back. But Mary stays right where she is. And so we pick up the story here with the 11th verse. Hear the word of God. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid. When he had said this, she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? And supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, she must have reached for him, because Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Pray with me. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts, be pleasing in your sight. You who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Most of you know, I think, that here in stained glass, we have the risen Christ reaching out for all the world. And most of you also know, I think, that if you look just under the left shoulder of our Lord, you'll see, sort of hidden, but nonetheless there, Mary Magdalene, who is the first Christian preacher because she is the first to announce the news that Christ is risen. And there she is, sort of in the shadows, and yet the first one to share the good news. You know, Mary is in tears before she's had this encounter and realized who the gardener is. She's in tears. She looks into the tomb. She sees the angels who ask the question, woman, why are you weeping? The same question the gardener is going to ask her. Why are you weeping? And let me stop right there, because that's a really good question. The writer of Frederick Buechner says this about tears. You never know what may cause them. The sight of the ocean can do it, or a piece of music, or a face you've never seen before. A pair of somebody's old shoes can do it. But of this, you can be sure, whenever you find tears in your eyes, especially unexpected tears, it's well to pay the closest attention. They're not only telling you something about the secret of who you are, but more often than not, God is speaking to you through them of the mystery of where you have come from and is summoning you to where, if your soul is to be saved, you should go to next. I myself don't often cry, tears streaming down my cheeks, but I do find my eyes filling with them every so often, and more and more the older I get. I've played enough basketball to know the sorrow that you see on the faces of those losing teams in the NCAA basketball tournament is just crushing as they leave the floor, their heads bowed, their dreams destroyed. I plan to say that before my alma mater got crushed yesterday. <laughs> but I see a photo of my lifelong friend Carrie, gone too soon. The tears come. I walk around this campus and I see in places where people whom, who shared this life with us and who are now at the great feast, I think about them and tears come. I used to stifle those tears but not anymore, and neither should you. 
We do know why Mary's crying. Her grief is wrenching. I mean, on the one hand, we're talking about Jesus, someone that she has known as teacher, someone she calls Lord, but also this Jesus is her friend, is a living presence in her life that she now believes is gone for good. So we know why Mary is crying, because we have all cried tears like hers, all of us. Because this world with its, all of its beauty is tragic. I mean, the clock is always ticking. And the end comes for all of us when we step from this life into what's next. So why am I weeping is actually still a good question. To think about why is it that I'm weeping? What is it that I've lost? And you don't really know, I don't think, at least not in my experience, you don't know what you've lost until you've lost it. And sometimes that experience is, you feel the tears are a sign of a gift, and at other times the tears are just stark and overwhelming, and many times they're both. But no matter which, no matter which the weeping is, is one measure of the love. It's one measure of the love. The love that, in the New Testament, promises us the love that never ends. So there Mary is standing out there, outside the tomb, weeping, paying attention to her tears, as we should pay attention to ours. And she's doing so in front of someone she supposes is the gardener. And maybe she's not so wrong. If you think about the very first garden, the Garden of Eden, where the gardener is the Lord, maybe Mary's not so far off. But still, she stands there with the risen Christ looking right at her. Resurrection is literally staring her in the face, and she does not know it. She does not know it. And I wonder how often the risen Christ stares us in the face, and we don't know it. How often resurrection is right there before us, and we're not aware of it. You know, the gospel stories tell us that this happens not only on Easter, that over and over again there's this pattern of ending and beginning, of, of losing and recovery, of death and resurrection, all over the place. The parables of the prodigal son, the lost sheep, the so many people who are trapped by their past whom Jesus sets free, the paralyzed man, the woman healed of illness, over and over again. When Jesus tells his disciples why he has come, though, what he says is not just about the forgiveness of sins, though that's part of it. What he says is not just that he hopes they'll go to church more often, though I think that's a good idea. No, he says, I have come so that you may have life. And not just any life, but life, the abundant life. Not just going through the motions, not just phoning it in. I've come that you may really live so that at the end of your days you will not say, I wish I had lived more. That's why Jesus came. And to that end, when we come to those losses, those endings, those deaths, Christ is there, the risen Lord, before us, though we may not see, with resurrection, with hope. This pattern, this pattern of loss and recovery, of ending and beginning, of death and resurrection, those are the fingerprints of God. The fingerprints of God, whether you see them as such or not, that's what they are, the fingerprints of God. As I say that, I'm thinking about every drug and alcohol counselor I have ever known. None of them started out that way. Every drug and alcohol counselor I've ever known, there was a time in their lives when they looked in the mirror and saw an addict, someone who could not escape the power of the drugs, of the alcohol. And yet now here they are counseling others about how to escape. And they're good for Christ precisely because they have been there. But in that moment when they were looking in the mirror and saw nothing but an addict, 
they didn't see the risen Christ. They didn't see resurrection staring them in the face as well. I'm thinking of the African-American civil rights leader years and years ago, I can't remember which one, who was asked about the defeats and the losses and the failures. And with a rueful smile, he said that every loss, every defeat, every failure is one step closer, one more, one more rock in the wall that needed to be built. One step closer to the day when the vote, the right to vote would be theirs, would belong to everyone. Whether he was around to see it or not, he trusted in that pattern, that resurrection, even when he could not see it. I'm thinking of Viktor Frankl, who was an Austrian Jew who spent years in concentration camps during World War II, and afterwards he would become a psychiatrist and an author of Man's Search for Meaning, which is still an amazing book. But then he did not know he would survive. When prisoners would be moved to a new camp, the first thing they would look for was smokestacks. Because if the camp had no smokestacks, then it was not a death camp. And they at least had a chance. How do you live in an environment like that? How do you go on? At one of those work camps, he and his fellow prisoners would head out before dawn to their work site. Every morning they'd leave in the darkness, in the cold, and the only light to be seen was in the kitchen of a farmhouse that they would pass. And inside, you could see the mother cooking breakfast. You could see the children getting ready for school, and you could see the farmer getting ready to go out and work on his farm. And seeing a family living a normal life, just living a normal life, was hope for him. That maybe someday there would be a, a normal life for him too. It was literally a light shining in the darkness. Resurrection. Right there before him. The risen Christ is out there loose in the world, waiting to be recognized in the most unlikely places. Resurrection is out there, staring us in the face, even and especially in the most unexpected circumstances. Back to Mary in the garden. She's actually experienced that resurrection in her own life when Jesus healed her. But she's not seeing it, him now. And we don't see it either usually. Even if we've experienced that pattern, that, that ending and beginning, that loss and recovery as most of us really have. We don't see it when our hope is exhausted. But then for Mary, something happened. Something amazing. Something remarkable. Something completely ordinary, the gardener calls Mary by name, by name, Mary, Mary. It's not the sight that opens her eyes, it's the sound of his voice. And if you've been listening to the Gospel of John as we have these last many weeks, you'll remember that Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, I call my sheep by name, and they know my voice. Has that happened to you? You're at a dead end. It feels like all is lost. There's no hope. But you hear your name spoken, not with the hearing of the ears, but with the hearing of the heart. Whether you name that voice as God, whether you name that voice as the risen Christ or resurrection, there comes a time when that voice calls us all by name, I believe, that comes to us in those times and tells us we're not finished, all is not lost, that there's more life to live, so much more life to live. I think one of the fringe benefits of being a person of faith to being a friend and a follower of Jesus is that when he calls you by name, you've got a better chance of hearing it. 
because you've been listening for that voice all along. Christ is in the resurrection business. It's his pattern. It's what he does. And if you listen for your name eventually, you'll hear it. The truth is it's a whole world Christ is resurrecting. Jesus is not just in the, I'm going to save this one and that one and that one and this one. No. No, if you read the whole of Scripture, Christ is resurrecting all the, the cosmos. That's the world, the word for world. All the cosmos, everything. Anything and everything he's resurrecting. If you read the end of the book, go to the end of Revelation, the very last chapters, it's a whole new heaven and a new earth that God's building. God's resurrecting all of it. And for our part, we're called to be Easter people in a Good Friday world, as William Sloan Coffin used to say. We're called to trust this resurrection pattern that's found everywhere. To trust that resurrection is staring us in the face even when we don't see it. To trust that Christ will call us by name when the time comes for, for recovery, for a new beginning, for resurrection. In our lives and also in this world that so desperately needs to be raised. So Christ calls us to be prisoners of hope, I think. That's the Old Testament phrase, prisoners of hope. And Christ will deliver on that promise. And when this life is over, Christ will deliver again. Because if that's the pattern in this side of eternity, we can be sure that will be the pattern on the other side as well. So our part is to choose to be Easter people, to choose to trust this pattern of resurrection and to work for resurrection and life for ourselves, surely, but also for one another and for this cosmos, this world for which Christ gives his life. To trust that the God who created all of this in love will not give us up to death, not now, not ever. You know, we spent a good part of these last weeks talking about hope. And I want to end where we started. The very first week, we heard these words that Jane Savage said to us. Jane and Robert watch us every week, and Jane knows a lot about hope. They both do. The source is someone on Twitter named Michael, I think. That's all we can find out about him. But he said this about hope. People speak of hope as if it is this delicate, ephemeral thing made of whispers and spider webs. It's not. Hope has dirt on her face, blood on her knuckles, the grit of cobblestones in her hair, and just spat out a tooth as she rises for another go. Pray with me. Lord, make us people of hope. Make us people of hope who trust in your resurrection, even when we can't see it, especially when we can't see it, in our own lives, in this world that we share. Make us people of hope, Easter people, people who, who seek to love as you continue to love us. For the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, for one another's sake, for our own sakes too, we ask it. And let all God's people say, amen. We worship God now with our gifts and with song. Oh, no. 
So I know we're not a Baptist church, but we can do the amen thing too. So for our musicians and sanctuary decorators and our AV team, let all God's people say, amen. amen. I think you could even raise the roof a little more. You can do this. Let all God's people say, amen. amen. On this day of all days, let us remember that life is short and we have but little time to gladden the hearts of those who travel with us. So let us be swift to love and make haste to be kind. And may the grace of our risen Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you, with those whom you love, and with those whom God loves, which is all of us and each of us, every single one. Amen.
Thank you very much. Very good. Don't forget, we have one more service to do. Jacko, let's do 